Let's welcome in the Attorney General of the state of West Virginia. He could be the next governor. Patrick Morrissey, good morning, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. Good morning to all of you, and hope the heat is not uh, treating everyone too badly. I, I know I got back up to my uh, my house in the eastern panhandle this weekend, and I walked in, and it was 95 degrees. So uh, Inside the house? To those without air conditioning. Oof. I guess you didn't have it on. <laughs> no, no, it's broken. So oh. uh, that was the issue. So it was a, uh, a bit of a warm weekend. You need to call Eric Householder. I did, actually. Yes, yeah, see? I did. <laughs> yeah. I did call, you know. So we're working on it. We're working to, re- to get everything fixed up. Yeah, I, I, got, uh, I had Eric at my house uh, last spring. And let me tell you something, dude. I mean, I got air flowing I didn't even know I had before. There's, there's air coming from places I didn't even know they were opening. Uh, It's sweet and cool in that house now, baby. Hey, I got uh, a letter through the U.S. Mail yesterday. It was addressed to my wife, and it was from a a law firm in Canada, Patrick, that says that uh, possible match, uh, somebody with the same last name as me, died in Canada, and this attorney has been searching for years to find the, uh, the next of kin, because there's eleven million five hundred and fifty thousand three hundred dollars in a life insurance plan uh, that my wife could be the beneficiary of if she would just contact this attorney and give him some information. He's offered to split this life insurance policy fifty fifty with her uh, if she will provide this information. This doesn't seem like a scam, does it? So, Rob, is there something you want to tell the listening audience today? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, thinking, uh, you know, it'd be nice to get my half of this $11 million, but, Oh, boy. But, you know, you Pat, know, I, Pat, I, talk, I, I tell talk, what, it's, it's, go, ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, before we went on there, Rob read that to us, and how more sophisticated these things are than what they were, what, five years or so ago when the Nigerian prince died <laughs> and came in with all misspelled words, everything else. This is very professionally done. So, mm-hmm. look, look, the scammers are getting better and better, and I think also with AI on the ascent, you can watch in the upcoming years. It's got to get tougher and tougher to detect differences, and you start to see. We hear a lot of reports about people so-called befriending folks on social media, and then they get access to the account. They're learning people, who they are, the different habits that they have. And I tell you, uh, you can write up a note that seems very believable. And so that's one of the reasons why we urge people, do not, under any circumstances, send this unsolicited money uh, away. Do not fall prey to people you don't know. Identity theft is a very real thing. And we're urging people to make sure you actually know what the cause is. You know it's legitimate. You can call our office. You can make sure that you're verifying the cause. You're verifying the organization. That's a much safer approach. Well, I thought of you yesterday when this came in the mail. I thought, well, Patrick's on tomorrow. He might get a kick out of this letter. Uh, what timing, right? And, and if it's true, I do get half of this $11 million, Bill. I'll be almost in your league. Not quite, no, no. but I'll be almost in your league. <laughs> Both of us be uh, <laughs> struggling to catch up with John, though. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> All right, I know Mr. Gilstrap has a question for you, uh, Patrick, in regards to the recent decision on Chevron. Yeah, well, yeah the, go ahead. The Chevron decision, as I understand it, uh, takes – in the past, when Congress would pass a um, an ambiguous law and would push the interpretation of the law down to the uh, the technical people in EPA or OSHA and such to to then add the specifics and then enforce the law at the granular level, is is, is that kind of what the Chevron uh, deference was in the past? And then that would be supported by the courts. Yes, I mean, I guess I would explain it this way. Uh, Throughout time, courts always afforded respect to the agencies that implemented programs that were passed by Congress. But over a long period of time, kind of culminating with the Chevron legal decision back in the 1980s, that respect, which is natural, turned into binding deference so that regardless of whether you even thought that there was clear delegation to that agency, whether they have the authority or not, they those agency regulators 
we're going to get the benefit of the doubt on matters that the statute didn't speak about, on ambiguous matters, and that gave those agency heads enormous amounts of power to regulate. And so uh, now this court case says the most important thing we're focusing on is was there clear delegation and do the agencies actually have the power? And the courts are going to resolve them uh, as opposed to having this arbitrary binding deference that just because there are people that are knowledgeable at a particular agency doesn't mean that the law was actually delegated to them. So, so my question is, I, I spent a long time, I was a safety environmental engineer for 35 years, so I, I dealt a lot with these regulations. And there's a whole level of judiciary called administrative law judges that are right. dedicated to deciding and adjudicating a lot of these disputes. Uh, so when it comes to establishing permissible exposure limits for different chemicals in the workplace and all of that, is does this have a, a, a huge impact on that and an administrative law judge is no longer relevant? Uh, I think that it can have an impact if the source of the authority that the agency has been using has been questionable and as it should have an impact in those areas, right? Because to the extent that there's not been proper delegation from Congress to an agency, that means that agencies may be acting without power. But if the agency head has been acting consistent with the statute, then no, it won't have a big impact. So it all depends upon the circumstances. And I think one thing you will see, given that the federal government has really grown tremendously over a long period of time with its regulatory power, you're going to see efforts to challenge more statutes and try to make sure that they're regulating the right way. But uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that a particular interpretation will change, but if it's incorrect or there's no legal authority, well, it certainly should change, and I think that's what you're looking at here. Obviously, you still have to go through other tests and look at statute of limitations, and you have to look at um, the nature of the challenge you're bringing. You have to um, craft arguments for standing, but uh, yeah, this, this is going to have a big impact. It should have a big impact in terms of the administrative state, which I think has been operating really without as much authority as it's it's been needed for a long time. But Patrick, where is the sweet spot in this argument? Uh, we have a dysfunctional Congress. Uh, we have a uh, uh, the uh, the intellectual the 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 scientific basis resides in the agencies, and the courts do not have the uh, scientific experience. Uh, so if we shift it away from the agencies, and I agree with you, there's been some overreach by the agencies, but if you shift away from the agencies, where does it go? You don't really have a depository in either Congress or the courts to address these highly complex uh, issues. So let me... Let me ask you sure. guys a question, because yeah. I always think it's important, because we get this argument a lot. When we were the lead uh, state to drive this issue, we've been trying to get rid of Chevron deference a long time. It's been a personal goal of mine, and I do frequently get the questions. And, of course, you always want to govern with knowledge, right? I mean, we can all say that that's a reasonable thing. It's better to govern knowing what you're doing than not. But imagine this situation. You might have an agency that has all this technical expertise, but what if you and I and we all concluded that there was no authority given to them to act, right? Let's start with that premise. There was no authority. Why on earth would any person who believes in our constitutional system think that we should be delegating authority um, to people that are not acting based upon – uh, the authorities that Congress provided to them. I, I, there's no sense to that. There's nothing that won't allow a court to respect a decision made by an agency that's an informed decision. I think the big thing here is now you look at was there a clear statement of law, and that's how it should be, right? I mean, do, do you guys understand this point that this is so important that deference is and, – and I'm sorry, respect is good – but we need to make sure that the law is actually commanding the action of the agency. 
Yeah, I, it's, it's fine. I can think of a number of examples like this, but one that just popped into my, my head when you were talking. Um, under OSHA, it's the Occupational Safety and Health Act, and there's it, it, when I first started, <laughs> shortly after it was passed, uh, as a safety engineer, it was about it only, OSHA only applied in a workplace, which was where you went and you got paid. And then over time, that morphed into wherever there is an employer-employee relationship, which means the, the expanse of OSHA authority was, was huge. It went to any volunteer organization, whether the fire department or anything else, where there's a hierarchy. So if somebody, if, if somebody in authority can tell somebody else what to do, that can be interpreted as an employer-employee work relationship, and therefore the Occupational Safety and Health Act applies. It's a massive expansion of, of what the yeah. original document was. And, John, so the question there would be, shouldn't that decision require Congress to step in as opposed to letting regulators make their decisions and expand without having authority, right? I mean, we are supposed to be living in a constitutional republic, and you can't just have the agency bureaucrats kind of make it up as they go along. So I think that there's no reason for anyone to be concerned about this ruling. This should be a ruling that's supported by people across the political spectrum who just want to have clear rules of the road. If you're an individual, if you're a company, you want to know, you want to read the statute, you want to have better understanding about what's going on. And if you actually disagree with your federal government, well, yes, you too get to petition to redress your grievances, and you get to go into court, you get to challenge it. And if you're right, it's not just that you're going to um, have all of the disputed areas get decided because a regulator happened to decide it was right. The court's going to try to sort it out and be an honest arbiter between you, the party, and the government. It levels the playing field between you and the government. And it's a darn good thing. Uh, Patrick, uh, clarification. You and John have raised an issue I had not thought about. It was my, uh, the, the scenario that John laid out was expanding the scope of activity, expanding the uh, the original uh, boundary conditions. Uh, I was thinking that Chevron uh, stayed, uh, was challenging some of the decisions that were within the scope of uh, uh, of control, the, the scope of influence of an agency. So what John's saying was, obviously I agree with. The other one, I if it stays in the boundary conditions, how does the Chevron decision affect that? Well, I, I think there are a couple things. So I would look at this as in multiple sets of cases. There was a case a couple years ago, in fact, called West Virginia VEPA, where the court made the decision that they were going to look at areas where there was vast economic and political significance, and they were going to make sure that there were clear lines of authority that were provided to that federal agency, right? So that was a huge case. And now you're looking at um, a separate set of issues because that the, the vast economic and political issues were already covered under West Virginia VPA, and you say, okay, now let's look at areas where there was ambiguity in the statute or there was silence in the statute. So let's just take the example that came before the court. You had a bunch of fishermen, and these fishermen were required to have monitors on their boats to determine the level of the catch, the fish that they were allowed to catch, because there are limits put in place. When you go out to the Atlantic Ocean, you're counting, catching a, a mussel, you're catching all these types of fish. The, there are limits within a certain number of miles from the coastline. So now imagine that you not only the, – the statute says that there are going to be these monitors on the boats. The government said that now they're not only going to be monitors on the boats, you're going to have to pay for the monitors yourself. Mr. Fisherman and all the fishing boats, you have to pay for them. That was silent. That was not in the statute at all. Who was supposed to pay? It was not listed. The government decided, well, it's not going to have to pay, so it tried to impose that burden on the fishermen. The fishermen said, wait a minute, but we weren't provided with that. Uh, we, we, we're not supposed to pay for that. Why, why are we required to pay? And so that's the case that went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And what the court said is because there was silence 
There was no clear um, indication that the fishermen have to pay that um, there was going to be no deference to the agency and therefore uh, this binding provision that the fishermen pay for the monitors is thrown out. So that's, that, that's a good example for people to, to hear about, that there was nothing said about that tax. There was nothing said about that burden. Well, certainly we can reach agreement that if nothing is said about it, there should be no authority given to the government to act in that area. I, and I can appreciate that there's an interesting side story of why that actually happened. And uh, uh, the argument you're making, though, is from the, the legal aspect, but from the, the monitoring aspect, there was good justification. What was the justification? Happened. The justification was, uh, going back a few years ago, the Magnuson Act, and uh, uh, which controlled uh, fishing out to 200 miles, exclusive economic zone. Uh, prior to the Mag Magnuson Act, said only the U.S. Uh, fishermen could fish within these, these waters. Prior to that, the Portuguese and other nations had been coming in, and they have been fishing for the predator fish, the dog fish, and everything else. Uh, so when the Portuguese were kicked out, the U.S. fishermen had no interest at all in fishing for the predators. The cods were being threatened by both the predators and also the fishermen. The cod fishing was just about to go down the tubes. They practically wiped out the cods in the, in the Atlantic Ocean. And the National Marine Fisheries Service put restrictions on it. But they did not have sufficient personnel to have someone on every fishing boat. And the fishermen were abusing the fact they should not be fishing for cod. So the alternative was we'll put cameras on to try to control the amount of cod fishing or flounders that were actually being uh, recovered. So that was a justification. Now, was it handled correctly? You're making a very good point, Patrick. It probably was not handled correctly as far as funding. Patrick, let's, you know, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to. I was just going to have one other point. I think when you think about the, these issues, you should. We should also think about this. The aspect of modern life. It seems like everyone wants something to be regulated by the federal government, but our constitutional system really wasn't designed to work like that. It really meant that most of the major issues of the day get resolved at the local level, right? They're Locally, you guys are operating in a Berkeley County and the Eastern Panhandle, and most issues, you know, get resolved locally. Maybe your municipality, maybe your county commission. Then, obviously, a set of issues get resolved statewide, and you have your delegates, your senators, you have your governor. You enact policy through a process that's put forth under the state constitution, <clears throat> and then there's meant to be kind of a very narrow set of issues, interstate. In, nation, in nature or dealing with foreign countries where you're looking at the U.S. government, the federal government to act. And with all of these decisions over the years, you've seen the federal government grow by leaps and bounds, and more people are relying on the federal government when, quite frankly, they should be looking closer to home. And I'm hopeful that a case like this starts to send the message, now, wait a minute, Let's try to solve our problems more locally. That's better for the citizens because when citizens are involved and local community groups are involved, I think you get better informed government as opposed to people that might be hundreds of miles away from you who have no idea about your way of life. Now, obviously, you're talking about certain issues. Maybe it's fishing. Maybe it's uh, other matters, certainly national security. There are things that are federal in nature, and no one would dispute that. But I think that there's an effort overall to start to shift the nature of problem solving back to what the founders envisioned, and that's far better for our people. We only have about four minutes left. I want to talk about the, the Purdue Pharma ruling by the Supreme Court. Patrick, how will this affect West Virginia and the negotiations that have already taken place? Yes, I think one of the biggest ways it's going to affect it is the practical one is that uh, we had – I've uh, been working closely with the court, the bankruptcy court. I actually testified in the bankruptcy court to try to uh, increase the amount of money that West Virginia was scheduled to get because the original formula was focused on population almost primarily, and then it, it started to shift over. So at least there's more of a focus on the intensity of the impact of opioids on a state. So West Virginia's 
uh, numbers started to increase what it would have received. And by the time this case got before the Supreme Court, most people would think that West Virginia would get between about $60 million to $100 million, depending upon the value of some of the assets that Purdue were to sell. And so now uh, there's going to be mediation and negotiation about what to do next. And I think the next the logical thing is going to be that it's going to shift some additional responsibility over to the Sacklers, the owners of Purdue. And uh, what the court, the Supreme Court had said is that you couldn't immunize uh, these owners because they technically weren't part of the bankruptcy and the bankruptcy did not code, did not give you the ability to immunize people not part of the process from liability. And so I think now the states, the counties, the parties are all going to get together again with Purdue and effectively renegotiate this. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be a long process and there's going to be litigation that goes on for another 10 years. But I can tell the uh, listening audience we're already starting to get calls. We're uh, be going to begin having discussions with uh, our attorneys general colleagues and counties and cities and with the company to try to renegotiate what this looks like. But I, for one, think that we should have people held accountable for the decisions they made and not try to seek immunity through bankruptcy code. So uh, this, on one hand, it has a slowdown effect for money for West Virginia, but if it ultimately means more money for our state, more accountability, uh, that's not a bad result. 60 seconds, Bill. Yeah, you may have answered my question. Will this delay at all the uh, the, the access to the money for West Virginia? You know, it, it's hard to say. It depends upon what happens in the upcoming weeks and months ahead. Uh, but it, it is fair to say that there will be some delay in the process. But significantly, this won't delay all of the ongoing resources that came in through the other litigation this is just uh, Purdue Pharma, and that would be additive as to what's already been dispensed out to the counties and the cities and to the West Virginia First Foundation. So, uh, so nothing will change in terms of the existing structure in West Virginia, uh, but it might delay uh, how long it takes for any Purdue-related money to be dispensed to entities across our state. Uh, one more very quickly. How much money was the other funds, uh, Patrick? That was not not uh, Purdue. So uh, there was over a billion dollars gross do in monies in litigation from the state and the counties and the cities, and so then from there the court made decisions as to how much would be allocated for uh, for attorneys' fees, and then from there a uh, twenty uh, four uh, I'm sorry seventy two and a half percent was going to be handed out to the foundation. Uh, 3% is going to be uh, held in trust in case there are uh, different problems. And then 24.5% actually goes directly to the counties and to the cities. So as of today, uh, I believe there's about 222, 225 million in the foundation. And that's from uh, the first year of disbursement. A lot of these settlements have money that's dispersed over a 5, 10, 15 year period. So you're looking at a billion gross. You're probably going to talk about somewhere in the neighborhood of four or 500 million or more in the foundation. Obviously, hundreds of millions going into the uh, counties and cities. Uh, and it all it may depend upon what happens with Purdue Pharma and any other case that comes down the line, because that's going to be additive to that billion dollar gross number. Patrick, thank you very much for your time today. Hey, thanks, gentlemen. Appreciate it.